Welcome to Point Loma Church. We are so glad that you have taken time out of this holiday weekend to worship today. Since it is the 4th of July weekend, why don't you write in the chat how you are going to spend the holiday. Now whether this is your first time here or you're here with us every week, we do invite you to sign in and say hello in the chat if you haven't done so already. And this is just one of the ways that we can be with one another in worship. There's also a connection button in the upper right corner of your screen, which you can click on to learn more about the church or if you want to get connected to anybody here. We would love to hear from you. Now this is the second week in our new summer series called No, That's Not in the Bible, where we're finding out if popular cultural ethical phrases are derived from the Bible or not. So today, Pastor Chris is going to be unpacking the phrase, money is the root of all evil. And as we prepare for worship today, we do invite you to grab your elements for communion as we will be celebrating that later in the service. So now I invite you to settle in and be expectant of how God will meet each of us today. Good morning, my virtual sunshines. Welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend your morning here with us. No matter where you are tuning in from or how you tuned in, we hope that you feel the love of Jesus as we seek to grow deeper in faith and to be a reflection of his love. If this is your first time joining us online, we extend a special welcome to you. Man, how many of you think it is brutally hot outside? Well, in San Diego, it's warm. If you're somewhere else, you might be fine, but the heat is on here, so we know that summer is in full swing, and the last thing that our kids want to think about is going back to school, but we all know that the first day of school will be here before we know it, and to help assure those in need are prepared, the deacons are hosting their annual backpack and bus pass drive to benefit New Day Urban Ministries. Backpacks, school supplies, and bus passes are being collected all month long. Donations can be dropped off at the church, or you can ship them directly to the church office. Well, it's a new month, so that means a new movie for the Summer Movie Club. For July, we are watching the movie Wonder, starring Julia Roberts and Owen Wilson. 
This coming of age drama follows a young boy's attempts at fitting in with his peers. Watch the movie on your favorite platform and then join us to discuss it on Sunday, July 24th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Registration information is available on our website. And finally today, we are excited to encourage you to check out our latest episode of Conversations with Friends on our YouTube channel. This episode this week, we talk with Bob Lemke, and so let's get a little bit of glimpse of what we're going to be talking about. And what does, what does a surface warfare officer do? Surface warfare officer drives those gray ships around, you know, they, they, okay. uh, but they run those ships. And uh, they're skilled in um, going, uh, going into battle with those ships, but also giving humanitarian aid. Um, Navy ships are, use, are used and asked to do a lot of th different okay. things. And the officers and enlisted folks that run those are multi-talented and, and do what you have to do. Now you do, you're, you're really big in missions. Yes. I'm really involved with missions here at our church. And I heard you kind of drop a word just a second ago. When you, you, on the, in the Navy, you do humanitarian aid. Is that where you kind of got your heart for missions? Or did you, I, wh I where think, did that come I from? I think that's where it was planted, R.O., but okay. it wasn't, it didn't blossom for, okay. for decades. Okay. In uh, and my so my, my the big seed for my mission was in May of 1975 when we were evacuating Saigon. And that, my friends, is what we call in the business a tease. That's right. You wanted to know more? Well, you got to go and check it out on our YouTube channel, or you can go to www.pointlomachurch.org to find and click on the banner for conversations with friends. Let's go ahead and continue on and worship this morning.
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I Please join me in the prayer of confession. Extravagant God, you have given us so much. Give us one more thing. Give us thankful hearts, because we know our hearts can be hard and cold. We often hold on when we should let go. We are clutching when we should be spending, hoarding when we could be generous, doubting when we should lean into our faith. We are fearful instead of trusting in your everlasting care. Open our hands and our hearts to the bounty of your love, which cares for the flowers in the fields, the birds in the air, each child who toddles, every parent who worries, every adult who struggles. Loving God, you have given us so much Give us again the assurance of your love and care and fill us with grateful hearts and open hands. Amen. God, your forgiveness is greater than our sin. Your love is deeper than our fears. Your faithfulness is eternal and your grace is sufficient for all things. Lord and Savior, we know that we are forgiven, so guide us to live daily in that redeemed life. Amen.
Dear friends, as we come to the scriptures, let us be in prayer. Ever-loving God, as we enter into the words that you have shared with us through millennia, may we be open to the guiding of your Holy Spirit. May we find in these words encouragement for our life, direction for our path, but more importantly, a powerful renewal of our relationship with you and how we live that into the community. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Dear friends, I wanted to uh, continue to invite you into the thoughts of the upcoming weeks as we have entered a new sermon series. Pastor Carla uh, is talking about uh, things that are not in the Bible. And it's an evocative kind of thing because I know for myself, when I first saw that title, I was thinking, wow, there really are a lot of things that we assume are in Scripture and ultimately are not, are just part of our culture and part of our upbringing. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to engage those things. And again, maybe hopefully um, offer some encouragement when we think something's in the Bible that we might have to kind of even look it up and find it for ourselves and and let that word soak into us. But today we're going to be reading a scripture from 1 Timothy, the last chapter as it closes up and wraps that letter. Timothy was a companion of Paul. He was a Christian from a young age, spent most of his ministry in Ephesus and the community surrounding Ephesus. He was a person that Paul trusted and wanted to give words of encouragement and direction. Uh, The struggle was that as the ministry of Timothy and Barnabas and others continued, more and more of outside influences came into and influenced the interpretation of the gospel. And as you know, Paul was was very strict about the gospel being true and that we need to stay true to that gospel. And much of 1 Timothy is, is an attempt to help Timothy with the community that was beginning to fracture and and show signs of breaking apart. And so he offers these words as part of the conclusion to his letter. So I invite you to listen for God's word to you this morning. I'll start with verse 6. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these things. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have noticed that this text begins with, of course, which kind of says, oh, what's in front of that? Why, why, of course, of course, what? And the line just previous to that talks about the reality that there were people in Ephesus in the community who were wanting to be teachers. It was typical of that age to have a a teacher in philosophy, the Stoics and skeptics, they they wanted to espouse their, their perspective on culture. And it seems as if in Ephesus, there were those who wanted to become teachers of the faith. And the struggle was that Paul saw many of them doing that, not necessarily to share the gospel or the way a person should live, but actually to be paid to teach. In other words, they were looking at the teaching of the gospel as an opportunity for gain. And that's why it says, of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. And so Paul states right up front that there is this struggle with money. We know that throughout the gospels, money is spoken of as something that is a struggle to manage and to have a proper perspective on. And so in this particular text, we run across that amazing phrase that money is the root of all evil. That's something that is kind of ingrained in us. And we heard in this text that it doesn't say that. It says that the love of money is what 
is at the root of so many different kinds of evil. And it's talking about relationships too, loving something. What is your relationship with things? And ultimately what Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to do is to make sure that people understand that money is something that is fine, but if your relationship with money is central to your life and, and you can't live without it, problems arise. And he wants people to understand that people can be content with things. If, if they have food, if they have a roof over their heads, if, if they have a community to be part of, that should be sufficient for contentment. And I guess sometimes the, the phrase comes up, when is enough enough? And so I think as we look at this text, we have to understand that it is the relationship to money and not money itself, which is the difficulty and the problem. We live in a country that essentially is based upon a capitalistic system requiring consumerism and money as the vehicle through which everything operates. Um, we can't get anything without money. We can't buy any relationships without money. But the difficulty is, is that what money is for? And so we struggle in our country uh, separating ourselves from that value and the constant drive in our communities and, and within our society to have more. Um, this is old news to everybody. How much advertising sneaks into everything that we see and everything that we do. I think that if we recognize that there's this constant push, we will understand far better the temptations and the anxiety and the frustrations that come with that kind of relationship with things, money being a tool. I remember when I had the privilege of, of spending three months on sabbatical in Kenya, and I had the privilege of going out into many, many rural areas. And in these rural areas, they have no coinage. I mean, there isn't any money. Um, since the beginning of time, they have lived on a barter system. And their wealth was never, ever measured in money. Now, granted, you could somehow or other uh, eke out a life and, and be content with whatever food you had and whatever uh, dwelling you had and whatever community you had. But if you decided to be greedy or, or take that desire to another level, then you started to do things that might not necessarily be good for your community, yourself, or even the world at large. And there were many who would um, cheat people out of things and uh, you know, sell them or trade a sick cow or um, some bad vegetables. That was their barter system. So they still could use their wealth in the community to do bad things, but by and large, the people that I met were the happiest people, the most faithful people, people who understood the power of God's presence in their life in a profound way, and it changed my life. It changed my perspective on how it is that we relate to the world and to God and to one another. And I think Timothy, at the beckoning of Paul, is going to spend some time in that community trying to help people through that temptation and through that value system. Let's go back to the text and, and look at this. We know that we didn't bring anything into the world and we won't take anything out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I'm sure that you have known people whose desire to become wealthy or find status or find some way of um, promoting themselves has led them to do some things that, that probably were maybe not unethical, but very, very unhealthy. A dear, dear friend, a guy named Dave Fish, who was 
a colleague and teacher with my wife, Martha. And he was an incredible teacher, phenomenal guy. And he and I ended up on a board of directors for a rehabilitation center in uh, Long Beach. And David was such a gift. He was organized, he was kind, um, he had a passion for, for people and children specifically. And he decided uh, that he was going to be a millionaire by the age of 40. And he mapped out this plan. And I mean, he was assertive, aggressive, he was all in. The struggle is that David died very young at the age of 42 had not made his millions yet, but had things put in place. And my struggle with what happened to David is that he was so committed to that path of gaining that money that very little else entered his life. He was driven. And this constant drivenness caused him to miss out on so much. And I think that if he had had the time to slow down and be content with the amazing things that he had accomplished and the, the wonderful things that he had done, that his life might have lasted longer because he missed out on the kinds of relationships that he needed to be part of and be fed by and nourished in. And I think part of what Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to do is to help people place the value of who they are in God's eyes in a different context and allow them to find that peace and that contentment and the ability to, to just kind of relax into enough is enough. And I have such a gifted life, such a gifted life. Then Paul goes on to say, for the love of money is at the root of all kinds of evil and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. If we're to think in our own world, what would happen um, if nobody was willing to pay for a relationship? What would happen if nobody would pay for drugs? Um, what, what would happen, <laughs> the old cliche, what if we had a war and nobody showed up? What would happen if the things that are so broken and horrible in our world that are based on the exchange of money and the greed of those who need it, how different would our world be? I was reading a statistic uh, that, from a book that was published about 10 years ago that the sex trafficking trade was um, worth about $10 billion a year. And that was 10 years ago. Can you imagine the value of that trade? as ugly and evil as it is. If, if we could change how we live and how we value people, we would not be looking for people to put into the sex trade or into indentured servanthood. Um, how different would our world be? Now, those are extreme things. And so how, how do we, um, as, as very privileged people who don't really have to worry about money unless we decide to, um, how, how can we make sure that our relationship with money and other things that um, fulfill the temptations of our life, how, how different would it be for us if we were able to live into a new way. The text that immediately follows this starts at verse 11, and, and this is kind of Paul's personal statement to Timothy. It says, but as for you, man of God, Timothy, shun all these things. And then he makes this list of things um, that we should aspire to. I, I almost wanna say, can we be tempted enough uh, to change our lives by engaging in these pursuits. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight. Take hold of eternal life. 
to which we were called, how different would our lives be if that was at the center, if that's what we loved and not money or other things that brought status and power into our life? Now, I know that we have a lot of examples of people just like that in our community and in our church. And I would imagine you could name some. I had a friend of ours that uh, lived in a town called Fox Chapel. It's outside of Pittsburgh, and I had the privilege of serving there for a number of years. And it was a very, very, very wealthy community. And um, Speed McClay, uh, he got the name for playing soccer, uh, Speed McClay inherited, took over a business that was at that time back in the early 80s, a multi-million dollar corporation. And Speed and his wife Dee and all five of their kids were the most humble, gracious, and unassuming people I think I have ever met. And um, they would take the bulk of their money and find ways of spending it, giving it generously to improve the community, to find ways of um, interacting with, with unions in, in, in Pittsburgh and others where tensions were high and steel workers were being laid off and just, it was such a mess at that point. And they found ways of taking their wealth, their influence, and entering that arena and transforming that community from one of desperation and hate to one of community and love that held together. And the ministry that they founded back then is still operative in Pittsburgh. And they didn't live um, extravagantly, but they were so happy and they were so engaged and um, they were just amazing, amazing people. And I bet we could think of many more, even in this community, that have done the same. And I would pray that as we continue to think about who we are in relationship to money, and fortunately this is not a stewardship sermon, it's a sermon about how to live every single day. It is not a particular season Every day we face the temptations that come on our phone, advertising in commercials, billboards, pop-ups, incessant. We're always engaging in a struggle to make a decision of how will I live my life and the wealth that God has given us, how will I engage the world? And I know that um, the church has made a great effort in transforming uh, one of the classrooms into a home for a family desperately in need of a home and a community. And those kinds of actions help us begin to understand again and again the value of being able to see what money can do if it is used properly. Money is not the root of all evil. It can be the root of evil if we use it and our relationship with it is, is broken in very destructive ways. So I would encourage all of us, um, when we're faced every day with decisions about how to use our money, that we would remember what Paul was trying to help Timothy speak into the communities around Ephesus. I think the words are words that we need to hear today because the constant push within our society and our culture to consume more and to have more and to get more and more, and I think on and on. So as we continue this series on what's not in the Bible, I would hope that we would understand that our desire to live a life of contentment in the world has a lot to do with our decisions about the blessings that God gives. Help us to um, live that into this community. As you walk out your front door today, look around you and find out if there are ways in which you personally can give of the abundance that you have 
so that others in your community and your community alone might be a place where people are nourished and strengthened and are ultimately shown what the gospel is all about. May we do that faithfully, boldly, remembering that um, things don't last, but because of Jesus Christ, we do. And our life will enter into that time of eternity, a gift from God. Amen. Dear friends, as we come to this table, I would invite you to gather the elements that you have set aside to join us this morning. As we come to the table, we know that there are others in our community and beyond that also gather at this table, that we are not alone, that we're part of a larger community that recognizes the power of the gift of this table, the power of God's love for us and his son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to give up his life for ours. As we come to the table, may we each individually and corporately remember that gift that we might understand again and again the depth of God's love. You probably remember the story as readily as I that when Jesus gathered for the Passover meal, he gathered in a small room that was probably filled with a lot of people, not only his disciples but followers, probably a lot of noise going on. But as Jesus began to prepare and put forth the meal, and everyone was settled, I bet there was quiet in the room, and maybe you're experiencing that now. May you sense the community within that space. Jesus was grateful for all things, and as he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. But this particular time, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat and remember. In like manner, the Lord, giving thanks, took the cup, And pouring it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. All of you, each of you, take and drink and remember. So let us now take the bread of life and partake. And now the cup of salvation. May the gift of this table nourish our lives and our community that we might live more and more and deeper and deeper into the love of God. Amen.
Well, as we enter our time of prayer this morning, I know there's many things on each one of your hearts as well as my own. Uh, be assured this morning that even if we miss certain things with our words, that God knows our hearts, He knows our minds, and He makes up for those things that we can't remember in the moment. But as we go to prayer, know that He knows these things and He hears the words we speak as well. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We acknowledge your presence here throughout this worship experience. And we lift things up to you, Father, that have been burdening us, the things that uh, have been weighing us down, the things that maybe not until even this moment we haven't uh, acknowledged or thought too much about, especially to come to you with them. So I would just ask for a, a moment to put those things on our hearts and our minds that we might offer those up to you here and now as we take a collective deep breath. Father, we trust in you. We thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for this overall idea of just generosity and who you've called and created us to be and how we might seek more of that out in our lives. Give out what we've been given. Lord, it's for the people in our neighborhoods, it's for the people in our family that are struggling that we come to you today, that we uh, would lift up whatever that situation is. We lift up our country, our nation, our city, and our world. We know today that we have not yet seen your full glory at work, and we find our hope in that, even in the darkest of situations. God, would you continue to mold each one of us that we might become daily more and more of the people that you've created us to be, that we might seek out and find more and more daily the purpose that you've called us for, here and now, to further your kingdom on the earth. And might we be obedient to act upon those things that we recognize. So as we continue to seek, God, give us opportunities to do so and give us opportunities to respond. And today, as we gather here, we lift up in singing the words that you have taught us to pray together. As we enter into our time of giving this morning, I know oftentimes, and I've been guilty of it myself, is we sometimes say things like, 
I'll just give a portion back, or I'll give a little bit back. We have this mindset of we've received so abundantly, but uh, let me just give, you know, keep a lot of it and then give a little of it. Uh, I've been reminded though recently, having an almost now one-year-old son, he's in that uh, stage where he just wants to freely give all of his toys. So he'll be in his play, his pack and play, and um, I'll dump 10 toys in there and within probably 30 seconds or a minute, he has given them all out. He wants to hand them right back to me and it's, uh, it's super fun and a little annoying because the toys need to continue to get washed over and over. But what an amazing posture of generosity in a one-year-old that he is so freely giving in abundance of everything that he has. And um, I know that sounds a little funny maybe this morning, but I, I honestly have been reflecting on that is, do I do enough of that in my own life? Of I have all of this, my main agenda is how fast and quickly can I give it away? So this morning, as we reflect on the abundance of what God has given to each one of us, might we respond abundantly out of joy. Freely, we have received. So now freely, let us give.
Dear friends, as we prepare to leave this community and worship, may we know that the same God that called us to this place now sends us out, that beyond the walls of wherever home we are in or community that we're in, that we have been nourished to serve and to be missionaries of God's love, care, and forgiveness in the world. Go now knowing that we are never ever alone, for the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit goes with us now and forevermore. Amen. Well, it was great to be with you in worship today. And I do hope, as Chris said at the end of his sermon, that we can have the eyes to see the needs around us as we walk out our doors today and have the boldness to respond if God prompts us to meet a need in some capacity. And if you'd like to discuss this sermon further, Debrief the Sermon is back and it's happening at 10.30 on Zoom. So the Zoom link is in the chat right now. And each week after service, there is an opportunity to put faces to the names that are in the chat. So there is a button that is in the chat that directs you to a Zoom link for a time of coffee and connection. And if you're not able to join us this week, but would like to stay connected throughout the week, I invite you to join the newly formed Point Loma Church Facebook group. And if you'd like to watch this service again or share it with a friend, all of our services as well as other content are available on the YouTube page. And while you're there, subscribe to the page so you get notifications when new con content is published in the future. So I hope that you have a wonderful and